Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss mystical works of literature and how they relate to recovery. We hope you enjoy today's podcast episode. Hello, this is Buddy C. Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. Today, I will be interviewing Todd W. Uh, if you did not hear our last podcast, we are changing the format, mixing it up a little bit. I'm going to be interviewing recovering folks that have been involved with the podcast. The Dow has resonated uh, with them and with forming and uh, looking at their higher power from just a, a little different view by using some of the literature that we've used. If you're new to the podcast, Go back in prior episodes we've done. I think this is episode 223. So we have a lot of good content on deposit for you to, to use. Uh, any announcements, just go to buddyc.org. You can find a lot of things there. You can you can find a daily Dow devotion to sign up for that's free. You've got all kinds of resources. You've got a sober meditations out there. You've got uh, some uh, verses of a book I wrote, and you can also get a free copy of the book if you email me from the website. I'll send you the most current PDF. There's a lot of things there, so just check it out, see if it interests you. Hopefully, it does. Also, too, pass it on to someone else in recovery that uh, may be struggling with uh, when they hear the word God, they cringe. You know, those people. Uh, if you cringe, then take a look at this. This might be for you. Who knows? Uh, we found the same principles in Taoist thought. Not that we had to become Taoist, but the principles themselves are the same that appear in other religious practices that look at God as being a God of love. Then, then you may find some things here. And you hear a lot of Taoist thought that you may not know is Taoist thought. Uh, we'll be talking about some of those quotes today. Uh, I would imagine let go and let God was probably at first a Taoist thought in some form. Really just the let go part, you know, just let go. Because whatever is God, will that makes room. And it's the emptiness there that makes us useful. So lots of good stuff. Todd, tell me a little, I'm just going to interview you and I'll just, Pop a few questions at at you. Welcome, first of all. Thank you. Thank you. Great For to be here. Time. I know you're busy, so I'm I'm very uh, grateful for you making the time for me, uh, and for everyone that will listen to this podcast. Um, where are you from? Give us a little background on your upbringing, if you would. Uh, paint a picture for me of a ten year old Todd. A 10 year old Todd. Uh, good question. Uh, so I was born in Denver and then was there through first grade, moved to Philadelphia for about a year, uh, and then moved to Seattle, then moved back to Denver, then moved to Kansas City, uh, then moved to St. Louis and then to Phoenix and then to Chicago and then to Ann Arbor and then to Milwaukee and then to San Francisco and then back to Milwaukee. How long? I mean, most of my, I've lived in 11 different cities in the U.S., um, but growing up, um, even within the same sort of metropolitan area, I went to 13 different schools before I got out of high school. Wow. Uh, so yeah, moved around a lot, um, learned how to be a chameleon pretty early on to figure out, you know, who the cool kids were and what it took to get involved and connected to those guys. And, I mm. uh, got pretty sophisticated at the art of BS, uh, cause you could just make up stories cause nobody knew your story cause you hadn't been around. So whatever you told them was going to be true. Um, but, uh, grew up in a very conservative Southern Baptist home. Um, I mean, according to my, um, parents, mother Teresa's was going to hell because she wasn't doing it right. Uh, you know, during high school, uh, I remember coming home and, and if I had friends coming over, I had to be really careful about letting them into the living room because mom and dad were watching Jim and Tammy Faye. And so very, you know, don't drink, don't dance, 
don't smoke, you know, all of those things. So a lot of um, rules designed to create an appearance of morality. So it was very, I suppose, sort of a strict conservative background from that standpoint. Probably by the time I graduated from high school, had been born again four or five times. Right, right. You know? And, uh, you know, when you get convicted and you weren't doing it right and he's like, oh, I got to get this stuff settled up again. And um, so, yeah, very conservative, um, knew pretty much what was wrong with every other denomination and every other religion and, you know, how they were all wrong. Um, But there really wasn't a whole lot of I mean, I never felt unloved, uh, but always this sort of belief that there was certain rules that you had to follow to stay in, you know, God's graces. And, you know, I would imagine your parents, like, like most are very sincere. Yep. Uh, it's not the fact that most people are being hypocritical. They, they're doing the best they know to do with what they've been given. So right. it's not nothing that, because I, mean, I know you very well. And I know that that's not statements you're making to condemn them or, or really criticize them. It's yeah. just what they knew. They didn't yeah. know anything different. Yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite uh, sort of paradigms from NLP or the Neuro Linguistic Programming, they say every action has a positive intent, that every mm-hmm. act is an act of love or a cry for love. And I think you're right. So I don't think that there was anything sort of manipulative about what they were doing. They were doing what they believed was was appropriate and was right, you know. Continued to hear train up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart from. It. Yeah, there's a lot. Being I'm from the South, obviously, there there was a lot of that here as well. When did you see the shift from having a a spiritual belief based on fear moved to a spiritual belief that was love based because all of my upbringing gave, I was fear. I was afraid of going to hell. Yeah. was the problem. I didn't know how to shift that to a, if it, if it was a love based belief, I wouldn't need the rules. I just would do the right things, you know, but with a fear-based belief, I have to. Did you have experience with that, Todd? Do you know, have you seen that over time? Yes, that's why I was born again so many times, right? Out of fear, right? It's like, right. oh my God, if I don't get this right, I'm going to end up in this burning lake of fire and, you know, be tormented forever. But I think, you know, looking back, it was really what I was supposed to believe Right. I knew what I was supposed to believe, not that I really believed. Oh, right? okay. okay. I didn't really believe it sort of at my heart, but there's these certain conditions that if I don't sort of follow these, then you know, there's going to be some dire consequences in the end. Hmm. So I, I think for me, you know, there was a pretty big shift. I mean, back in the like late 90s, when I had, you know, I have four boys and was in charge of the men's ministry at our church. And thinking back to even like the motivation, it was like to create a successful organization, right? More than it was anything to do with, you know, sort of really trying to point to some principles. I think for me that, you know, a big part of the the challenge was always because of, I think, moving around a lot, wasn't really sure who I was, you know, really didn't have this sort of identity because really wasn't encouraged to sort of form my own belief or my own understanding of things or to seek out, you know, truth in whatever form. Um, But you're just supposed to believe. And I think for me, um, you know, it's interesting because in, uh, in our local group, in my home group here, of course, it's March, right? So it's step three. So step three seems to come up every week at these meetings um, and talking about, uh, you know, the God of our understanding. Um, And I love the way that you put it, you know, the God of our misunderstanding, right? Because even if we 
Like it's even better, I think, of our misunderstanding than to say the God that we don't understand. If you don't understand, it means you don't understand it. If you misunderstand it, it means whatever your understanding is is probably not right in the first place. So I think for me, you know, a big part of that shift came when I really started to study uh, Qigong, which is based in Taoism. And you know, it's there's so many things that were born out of Taoism. Um, that most people, like you said, buddy, early is that most people aren't aware of where these sort of roots came from and, and what they were all about. But it was really studying the natural world around us, you know, and what are all of these, like, how does this universe continue to function the way that it does? And um, so I think for me, it was really, um, you know, thinking back, one of my sort of i think that a way a lot of people that have this sort of um disconnect or this revulsion to this sort of idea of god is that what the sort of the way you described it is that it seemed very oppressive and i think for a lot of people george carlin sort of nailed it right that there's this invisible guy up in the sky and he's got these 10 rules that you need to follow and then he loves you but he really needs your money and so I think that that um, you know it's it's ironic in a sense because I think that you know we're I think it would be harder in my mind to consider myself like an atheist where that seems like everything's just sort of an accident, right? There is no rhyme or reason to things. It really takes belief to be an atheist. You really have to probably I would think more. It would be more, it'd take me a lot, I would have to believe a lot harder to be an atheist than just to accept what comes my way and be what I am, you know. It doesn't take any belief. All I have to do is just the next right action, the next loving action, and the rest of it falls into place. That's totally paradoxical, and it's the opposite almost, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for me, a big part of it, too, was just a lot of of um, sort of I could never reconcile this idea that um, these really good people that I knew, maybe I never knew Mother Teresa, but she seemed like a good person, uh, that these really good people were going to spend the rest of their life in hell because they didn't believe a certain thing in a certain way, right, that they didn't make some sort of profession of faith in uh in a story and that they were willing to spend the rest of their life on it so i always had this struggle like how are all these really good people going to you know spend the rest of their life being persecuted when they've spent their whole life on here being better than i am but because i've made this i've been born again so many times that i'm going to be out you know live in paradise and you need to see your handshake yeah yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, and I think that, you know, for me, a lot of it is has been, you know, it's evolved a lot uh, over the last few years in particular. Um, and especially when I now sort of really believe that that the physical body, if we're not taking care of our physical body, the spiritual body is going to be very difficult to develop in the first place. And, you know, when I thinking back, like I remember even some of the pastors of these churches that we went to, these guys were obese, you know, and, and just, um, you know, all the stories about, you know, whatever adultery or even within the Catholic church, you know, all the, child abuse and all this stuff really had a hard time reconciling like if this is the one true way how could these possibly have this corruption that's going with it when there should be this alignment with whatever this sort of lifestyle is or worldview is that that should like emanate from every pore of your body as opposed to having this sort of super darkness that comes out at these times you know, you know, and also, Todd, you know, we, we see that, though, in all types of religious structure, we, we see those discrepancies, the abuse at times, the uh, the moral failings. And it's not that we don't have moral failings, because we do. I, 
I can only speak for myself, and I I fell <laughs> a lot of things. I think that when we start moving from thinking the form that we're doing is going to change us inwardly to taking actions, revealing that we already have what we're looking for and start opening the door to to what's already there. Like the light is covered up with our fear. And as we start surrendering our fears, we can start seeing the light that was there shining the whole time. And we just couldn't see it. Uh, Were you like most of us with your alcoholism? Were you, were you drinking because of those fears and, and all, all of, uh, of those, that's ex- exactly what I was doing. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's certainly elements of that. I mean, for me, a lot of those fears um, were, you know, when when I've gone through, you know, my step four, a lot of those resentments were with me, right? And and looking back at what caused those actions in the first place to create those resentments, a lot of those are based on fear. You know, fear that I wasn't going to fit in, fear that I wasn't going to be successful enough, fear that, you know, my parents weren't going to approve or fear of X, Y, and Z, the IRS, the student loans, the whatever. And so anytime that, you know, I would get uh, sort of overwhelmed by life, it was just easy to drink, right? Because you feel good for a while. Right. And and just the it it never felt good to be hung over. But that first sort of buzz, that sort of warm glow that everything's going to be all right, that lasts for however many seconds it lasts until it gets so dark. Um, felt always like a really good escape, you know, a really good way to kind of bury my head in the sand and just hope that when I come out on the other side, everything was going to be. It was going to be a magic wand or I'm going to hit the power ball or somehow things were going to take care of themselves. And I think for me, a lot of it was um, sort of a, a resistance to growing up, you know, a resistance to actually being an adult, you know, a, a resistance to, you know, accepting life on life's terms and, you know, thinking that somehow conditions were going to be what was going to result in my contentment or my joy or my peace and Mm. it's been you know really getting deeper and deeper into this qigong practice um is i have everything inside of me already that i need to be peaceful and content right there isn't something outside of me that's going to be able to to bring that right that it's really connecting to what's already here and so i've been doing a bunch of study recently uh, as I'm finishing up this Qigong teacher certification and been doing so much other study that, you know, you have access to this amazing, beautiful world, this energy that has created all of this. We all have access to this every single day and it's already inside of us. And so I just had, I was in um, Asia for three weeks, I was in Japan for two weeks and in Taiwan and became very clear to me that there is a big distinction in Taoism between sort of scholarly Taoism and religious Taoism. And that sort of the, the Tao Te Ching and the um, the temples that I went to. So we went, we went to a bunch of, I had to check them out, right? See what these temples were sure. all about. And so much of it, like it's it's the antithesis of what you see at church here. There's not a big church with the congregation and everybody goes and sits in on Sunday morning in their Sunday best and learns a message. Uh, You know, here's from the teacher. Here's from the preacher. Uh, You know, there there's um, I mean, it's very interesting. So there's a lot of, of certainly reverence for family, for elders, for the country, but also a lot of fortune telling. Right. So you go in and they've got these sticks that you spin around and you pull one out and it's got some writing on it and you hold on to that. And then they've got these little sort of wooden crescents that you roll on the ground and however they turn up or down or sideways or whatever, then it is gives you a reading. And then you take that reading to sort of the priest or somebody behind the counter and then they go and they look up 
what all these things say and what they mean. Um, and so it was very interesting for me to be doing so much work in in Qigong and for you know people that are listening that aren't familiar with Qigong. So Qi is just you know the life force energy that runs through us and runs through the universe, and Gong being sort of what you gain over experience over a period of time. And so it's really helping people really be able to have access to that energy. And one of the things that we talk about in Qigong is as above, so below, meaning that the way that the universe works, all those energies that are making this universe work are all happening within us. And Mm -hmm. so especially recently doing a whole bunch of work um, on really understanding more and more about how to access this energy and really focusing on this miracle that we are. I mean, the fact that we started with this invisible sperm and this invisible egg, and now we are these multi-trillion cells and really trying to understand, like I learned the other day that, and probably heard this when I was going through pre-med and chiropractic school and all of this, but, you know, a male produces somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 to 2,000 sperm a minute. It's insane, right? And wow. and and these are all these, think about, it's one of those little guys that created us, that created me, that created you. And you think about the power that is with inside those and the energy that is with inside those that really then drives everything that we're all about. So, so when the Tao Te Ching was written, it was years after whether there was ever this guy, Lao Tzu, whether it's a story or a myth or whatever it is. But it was a long time after that, that there became this religious Taoism. Like before that, it was very scholarly, right? It was really sort of focusing on that. And and I actually have this great book uh, that I just started going through. Uh, this is the Tao Te Ching, um, a Qigong interpretation. Hmm. And so it goes through a lot of the history and in the very beginning talks a lot about uh, really understanding sort of where this came from and spends a lot of time focusing on uh, the fact that if you don't have at least some sort of elementary understanding about Chinese thinking and Chinese philosophy, uh, it's going to be really difficult to understand a lot of the things in there. Even the Chinese have a hard time understanding what's inside there. Um, but that when during that time period, like so much of this was based on the I Ching or the I Ching, as they would say in Chinese. And the I Ching, the I Ching was around about 700 years before the Tao Te Ching was even a thing. So if you kind of don't have this understanding of this big universe that then became sort of this yin and yang and sort of like how that then sort of transcended into everything that makes up this world, it gets really difficult to understand what's happening inside there. So I think for me, it's been um, it's been really interesting, especially, as I said, because it's March and a lot of these meetings talking about step three. Um, and you've got people in in a lot of these AA meetings where they've been sort of reconciled to the God of their youth and they're back in church, which I have nothing wrong with that. If that's what helps them, that's fantastic. For me, when I say that for me, God is the Tao, which is the whole universe. It's what makes up all of this. And, you know, my my very favorite verse is the very first one. Like, if you can explain it, if you can talk about it, that's not it. Let's read it. Let's read it for everyone. Uh, Which version do you, which translation do you like best, Todd? Uh, Well, I always like Stephen Mitchell's stuff, but um, this is really, so this guy, Dr. Yang Jung Ming, um, is a um, martial artist and teaches a lot of Qigong. And his just starts and says, the Tao that can be described is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. And when I think about that, I was talking to somebody, one of my other Qigong fellows, and said, it's not any different than anything, really, like a tree. Like, we just gave it that name. But we don't really understand what a tree is. Like, everything, like what happens and how all the little leaves happen to happen when they do. How like, especially right now, hopefully spring is on the way. It's cold here in Chicago. 
um, and looking forward to seeing some green again. But that we have such a small version of reality. Like even, uh, you know, we've come so far with this technology, but I was trying to explain this to somebody yesterday. We're having breakfast. It's like even our version of reality in that room at that time isn't necessarily the reality, right? Like if a chameleon came in there, he would have a completely different sense of that reality. If your dog came in, your dog would have a completely different sense of that reality. And everybody else in that room has their own version of reality. So I think to me, when I think about God, trying to put God into a box and trying to believe, you know, even at church, you go to a church with 5,000 people in the congregation, there's probably 5,000 different versions of God in that room. And so I think for me, it was, you know, part of this transition has been, you know, really getting to that point that I don't know, but I know that, you know, that I'm not God. And that part about letting go as sort of you started with and, and feeling like I'm not in, I don't need to be in control. In fact, I can't be in control anyway. Thank God I'm not in control. Like if I had to be in control of my heart beating and somehow my eyes working and all this magic that happens inside our bodies on a daily basis, uh, it'd be a train wreck, you know, and yeah. especially uh, going through one of the books that was recommended is this book called um, A Child is Born. I don't know if you've ever heard of this one, buddy, but it's uh, yeah. A Child is Born. And it's got pictures that are just mind blowing of sperm and eggs and like of these photographs that they blow up however many tens of thousands of times and you think about the miracle that we are it's being an atheist for me it's not even on the table right yeah. like I, can't, I can't believe that this is all just an accident when you look at the power that all of that has um and so i think to me it's it's really now feeling more of a responsibility to live a good life to do the next right thing um, and, you know, some of the things that we've talked about before, when I find myself feeling uh, bad or self-pity or whatever, start to really turn the mirror around, look outside and see who else can I help? You know, who else, who else do I know that's got debt? Who else do I know that's struggling with relationships? Who else do I know that I can pray for and really start to understand um, I think now this opportunity to live a completely different life that's not based on me trying to, to, you know, stay within the lanes all the time. So I'm, you know, really trying to evaluate how it's being interpreted by the, what the Rastas would call the sky God, right? But it's really, how is it resonating within me? And, and how am I now feeling if I'm starting to feel more, um, you know, focused internally and see really what are those feelings that keep coming up, really being able to identify those and and really see what can I do to sort of reach out to other people. And it's amazing how that when you take that focus off of yourself, when I take that focus off of myself and turn it outside, I just start to feel better. I start to feel better about what I'm doing, the purpose that I'm here for, you know, in some sense, kind of gets to step 12, right? Kind of fast forward to there that, you know, really starting to reach out to help other people has been super transformative. You know, and the, and the thing with that too, Todd, if, you know, our prayer changes from God help me to God, who can I help? Mm -hmm. And when that shift takes place and we realize, you know, if, if we're all connected and if we're all one, when I help you, what I'm really doing is helping me. Yep. You know, it's not that I get rewarded some way for helping someone, not like it, that kind of thing. It's even more fundamental than that. When I'm helping someone else, I am really doing that for me because I am them and they are me. Yep. So it's just so simple. Um, so how did you, okay, I see the shift. Did did AA help to bring about that shift, or were you making that shift before from the the Southern Baptist God to uh, this oneness of of love and you know being? I guess would be the way to you know 
I'm just curious because AA made the shift for me because before that I came in not understanding why this was working for anyone because they didn't qualify. Yeah. Uh, well, it's you a great question. It or is that more than you've thought about? No, no, no. I mean, I, yeah, I, I, well, that's, you know, all of our problems think too much. Uh, yes. But I, I think that um, I think uh, for me uh, in the very beginning, uh, when I first came to AA with the fourth dimensioners and the Zoom online group, um, was really because I knew that step one, I knew that I was powerless and my life had become unmanageable. And um, from that point, sort of applied the same level of of uh, effort, if you will, as I did with a whole bunch of other things. Like this is just stuff to get through, sort of like just go through these steps, get them done with, and then kind of just go back to things the way they were, um, and not really taking the time to really absorb a lot of the steps. So for me, going through, you know, the the God piece of it in the beginning was like yeah of course I mean I know that's what I'm supposed to do and and yes of course step three got it yeah okay got it and then yeah make a list of people okay did that and you know kind of just go through the motions but for me it was yeah step three can you quote that for us that would be um I can the um here, I actually just had this up here. So for me, so step three, which then I really looking at the third prayer, but made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. And so now, you know, I replaced that with the Tao, sort of this bigger picture. Um, and I, you know, heard all these crazy stories about the three frogs and they made a decision and how many frogs are left? Well, there's still three. And then somebody told me the other day, but then the alligator came up and ate all of them. So, right. So it's like, there's got to be action involved with these things, right? That, that this really is a program of action. And for me, it was, you know, my, did the same thing with my Qigong practice, which is sort of doing it. And I needed to do it to kind of finish it, but wasn't really trying to build uh it as a practice, sort of just going through the motions. And I think for me, the hardest part in the very beginning, especially going through the big book, was sort of this kind of felt like reading somebody else's mail. Like it wasn't mm -hmm. really for me and all these sort of old language written back, you know, long, long time ago. Um, and feeling like, you know, not that they that I disagreed with any of it, like you know, I just telling somebody the other day, if any proof that you really need that there's a higher power, just think about the fact that it was two alcoholics that created this program. Like that, if that's not enough evidence of a higher power, I don't know what is, right? Like some of the stuff that they did and said, and when I think back, how many, how few people were involved with AA at that time, you know, now it's sort of like we take it for granted because there is meetings in every corner. There's meetings all around the world and they're all the same meeting, right? They all basically... You know, people, you know, sharing their experience, strength and hope. And and um, but the fact that we are dealing with this disease, this alcohol um, is a life or death issue. And I think that for me, it's been I needed to have something that I could really believe in and embody and that I was really giving myself to. And for me, that sky god or the George Carlin god wasn't it, right? It was just really difficult for me to connect with something that I had a really hard time believing in. And so for me now, deepening this practice, deepening and, and with a lot of this, it's really, as is everything, it's a mindset, right? And that's why just deeper and deeper into meditation and really trying to get more and more grounded and being more, uh, feeling this deeper connection to everything around me, you know, that, that there is this connection that if 
if I'm going through something, there's some way that you're going through that same thing. If you're going through something, which is why I love going to meetings, is is that there I hear something in every meeting. And, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, one of the the meeting chairs now, right, would go through and say, I love all of you guys. Some of you guys I don't like, <laughs> right? With, right. Which is true, right? So like, if you think about this cross-section of people that are in these rooms, probably wouldn't be friends with these guys outside of those rooms, but there's some connection of the stories that they're telling that deeply resonates with who I am and that I feel at that point, um, I'm at a point now where I want to develop this, this closer and closer relationship, not because I feel like there's more and more things that I can get, uh, or that there is, you know, sort of like the the Santa Claus version of God, you know, where I just keep praying, you know, all the, the, um, uh, you know, the dire prayers, like the Hail Marys, you know, when you're in the trenches and you really need it. I heard something really good the other day that really resonated with me about um, this guy was talking about all of this uh, debt that he had, which I could relate to. And he said that instead of him praying, right that God would eliminate the debt, he prayed that God would relieve him from the fear of those consequences. Ah. Ah. And so if if you can pray for God to remove the fear, who knows what's going to happen, right? And even we talk about going through like steps eight, steps nine, there could be some other things on the other side of that that you don't want to have happen. Like we talk about maybe have to go to jail, maybe have you know, whatever, some sort of garnishments, whatever, or, you know, once you get found out, right, that, you know, something's going to happen. But for me, the big part of the change, like you said, is to not pray for me, start to pray for other people. But also that when I do get overwhelmed, that I'm praying, not that the circumstances will be fixed by God with some magic wand, but pray to have that fear removed. And that's been a big game changer for me. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, for me, it's really now wanting to have a deeper and deeper practice, which to me is really connecting deeper to the Tao, connecting deeper to the the world around me uh, and sort of the universe. But, you know, sometimes I talk about Qigong and some of this stuff and, and I get a little leery that it sounds a little too woo-woo, right? A little sort of, you know, namaste and, and a little bit sort of like freaky, in that sense, but to me, it just it provides a lot more grounding. Um, and you know, some of these things, even doing standing meditation for like five or ten minutes, changes your complete energy, changes the way that you feel and the way that you approach the rest of the day. So, you know, for me, it's been um been a journey for sure. Uh, but I think continues to go back to just this deep appreciation for every day above ground. And the fact that I always have, I still have both legs, I still have both arms, I can still see, I can still hear, I can still smell, like all these gifts that I still have that I've been given, but then to really use those to help benefit other people as opposed to trying to figure out how to fix my problems. Yes, yes, that's good, that's good. Um, You know, when we just take a deep breath, we're doing part of what you're talking about with Qigong is that you're connecting. Yep. You're connecting with what is. You're grounding when you take that deep breath. Yep. Even if it's not followed by a meditation practice, there's something that happens there. When I was talking to Dennis uh, last week, uh, we talked about that uh, the reason folks like Christmas so much, you know, it's because it's the only time of the year they may do something Altru- altruistic, you know, something for someone else that they don't expect something in return. So they feel good. They don't know why, but they love the Christmas spirit, you know. Yeah. I think for that reason, uh, we're not used to giving. We're not used to that. We, If we give, it's got hooks. You know, we want something back. Yeah, I heard one of my Qigong teachers said something the other day that I imagine is true. I don't know how they figured this out, but uh, seems to kind of make sense. So you're talking about the lungs, right? And so with Qigong, we start with the breath. So we start with breathing uh, because oxygen, you know, they say the lungs are the commanders of Qi and you can live without 
food for a long time. You can live without water for a pretty long time. Uh, I could live without chocolate. Uh, I'm learning more and more every day how to live without alcohol, feeling better every day. But try living without oxygen, right? Try living without oxygen for very long. Like even if the oxygen levels change a little bit, when my son Jacob was born, was in the neonatal ICU because he has, even though he was a big kid when he was born, uh, he had a deficiency of an enzyme called surfactant and he, his body wasn't able to get enough oxygen. And so every time they would take him off the oxygen, his oxygen rate would plummet. We were in the same room, right? right. Breathing the same air, breathing the same oxygen. But what this Qigong teacher said the other day, supposedly, is, is that over the course of about two or three weeks, all of the air in the atmosphere has been recycled through everybody on the planet. Hmm. So you think that oxygen, the CO2 that you exhale, the oxygen that's coming back in, all of that is recycled around this entire planet every couple of weeks. So we're absolutely connected to everybody else, you know, and and even though I might not have a whole lot in common with, uh, you know, some people in uh, Calcutta, India, um, you know, we're all deeply the same at the end of the day. If you look at DNA, even if you look at DNA of, uh, you know, your dog is 90% the same DNA as you. Yeah. There's lots of, uh, you know, lots of uh, even plant life and uh, lots of things that exist here that the DNA is very similar. So what comprises us is, is very similar in, for most. Yeah. Most yeah. different mammals. And I think even like a banana were 60% the same DNA as a banana, you know? Yeah, well, it's funny you say that. So we talk about how, you know, the monkey mind Mm -hmm. uh, and that the monkey mind, what does a monkey need uh, to make him feel better? He needs a banana. And so one of these Qigong teachers the other day said that our banana is oxygen, right? And that if we're not breathing, like our brain uses the majority of the oxygen, like this thing that's sitting on top of our heads uh, is, you know, there's so much that we don't understand about it. Um, and, you know, what you said about the breath, like the breath really controls our emotions. You know, when you think about when people are sad and depressed and they're all hunched over, and then some of the Qigong exercises, we talk about, you know, helping with inspiration and confidence and courage. It's expanding that and taking in those really deep breaths and really feeling grounded And the ability that you have by really paying attention to some of these things for everything from just lowering your blood pressure, like very quickly, like there's some one called pulling down the heavens, you just kind of put your arms up over your head and pull them down slowly. If you have a blood pressure, check your blood pressure monitor before you start and then do those exercises pulling down the heavens and you'll be shocked about how much lower your blood pressure can get. Hmm. That's something we all have access to right? Every single second of every single day. So I think to me, you know, it's it's interesting, a big part of Qigong in the very beginning all starts with breath work. It's not some fancy Kung Fu moves. It's really understanding how to breathe and how to really breathe deep through our belly. You know, in the beginning when we're born, and buddy, cut me off anytime because I could talk about this stuff for a long time. But when we're a little baby, right, that our mother's don't have enough power to give us all the food and nutrition that we need. So that umbilical cord, the baby is inhaling and exhaling through its belly. It's creating this pump. And then after we're born, we slowly quit breathing through our bellies and we start breathing through our chest. And it's really doing a lot to sort of damage all the organs underneath. So we're not really getting those deep breaths into the belly or what we talk about the Dan Tien, this energy center that's below your belly button. If you're not expanding and and, and um, contracting that area and you're not getting that through the rest of your organs, it's crazy. So for me, I mean, part of the reason I got into Qigong is I just don't like going to the gym and it just takes too much time and, and you know, all of that. But I wanted to be able to create a practice that I could use anywhere that I didn't have to get in special clothes for. I could do in the park. I could do by the beach. I could do in my apartment. I could do, you know, from anywhere. And, you know, really being able to really focus on that breath. One of the things that I noticed probably right about the time that I first got sober was how many times I was holding my breath. 
like I would be in situations and I would feel this anxiety or fear, like I was worried about what the boss was going to say or the kids or the wife or the whatever. And I would literally be holding my breath. And you think about what you're doing is basically suffocating your body from the energy that it needs to function at that high level. Mm. And so now really focusing on like, how do you do this breath work, focusing on these big, deep belly breaths. There was a study done recently by some physical therapists and they had done 35 different people through this sort of weight loss course. And the only thing they had these people do was do these really big, deep belly breaths and focus on doing those for 10 or 15 minutes every day. And the amount of weight that those people lost, as opposed to this control group, didn't change anything else, was dramatic. Mm. Mm. Hey, if um, <laughs> so, someone wanted more information about what you're doing, where should they go? Is there a website you could forward them to? At That's this- a good That's a good question. In fact, so I'm actually teaching a lot of Qigong right now through my business here in Chicago at the Red Light Body Shop. And actually, the last two days, I just started posting on Instagram. So if they go to redlight.bodyshop or at redlight.bodyshop, we're going to have some Qigong there. They can reach out to me anytime, just todd at grooveenhancers.com. But I'm working on a a business that's slowly uh, sort of... uh, coming to life called Qigong, uh, which is really understanding tea and the different energies in teas, but then also incorporating a Qigong practice with that. So, but I could talk about this stuff forever and, and uh, I'm actually going to start teaching some Qigong to a local youth hockey team. So wow. cool. hoping that as well. So cool. uh, I was looking at if we had any more Tao related questions. Um, is there any aspect that we haven't mentioned of higher power. Like a like when I came in to recovery, there was gaps. This is what I thought of a higher power, but I was seeing these things happen and there was no way to get from A to Z. I could not get there. And there were some gaps that, uh, that the dial really helped me with. Uh, this concept of stopping the thinking, stop your thinking and end your problems, that was huge. Are there any concepts like that for you that you can recall that we haven't mentioned that helped you from, you know, when you came in, you started seeing that I'm missing something here. What, how can this make sense to me? Uh, is there anything there for you? Well, I think. You know, one of my favorite books that I give to a lot of my clients, so I still do a lot of business coaching, Mm -hmm. uh, is a book called Real Power, uh, and it's business lessons from the Tao Te Ching. And one of my favorite chapters in there is you're not in control. Mm -hmm. And back to your point about letting go is, you know, there's certain things that we can influence. There's certain things that we have the ability and a responsibility, right? I think that a big part of, you know, sometimes letting go means an abdication of responsibility, which isn't the case, right? But it's letting go of whatever the results are, doing the right thing, right? You said let go and let God, you know, really let, uh, you know, trust that uh, everything's going to be all right. You know, when I start to get overwhelmed and I think about the universe, I can't imagine, you know, I had a chance to go to the planetarium the other day. Mind blowing. I mean, this, the fact that we are this little teeny thing, but we're so absorbed in our heads all of the time about that we think that we somehow are are able to kind of think our way to solutions or whatever. So for me, a big part of that, like you just said, is just letting go, realizing that I'm not in control anyway. Uh, but what I can control is, you know, my breath, when I f- feel myself, when I feel myself getting emotional about things, trying to really pay attention to where that's coming from. What is that? You know, one of the uh, the great things that, um, and maybe this is a good thing to close on. So we talk about in, um, in the Tao Te Ching, we talk about um, different things to talk about country and policies and the monarch and all these different things so we talk about um what they call the five sort of regulations and so then qigong equates uh the body so there's five of these and they work in terms of qigong managing a family ruling a country or the battlefield and all of these things are right out of the Tao Te Ching 
So in Qigong, the first one is the body. So you have to start with your body. Uh, the next one is breathing, right? And the breath. The next one is the mind. The next one is the chi or the energy. And then the last one is the spirit. And so you go through that and you think about how that works as well. So you talk about that the body in this case is the battlefield. The breath is the strategies. The mind is the commander. The chi is the soldiers that can go out and get everything done. And the spirit is sort of morale, mm -hmm. right? Or those morals, the ethics that sort of drive everything. So for me, it's, you know, what I love about it is that um, there's nobody that I've ever talked to that says they can explain the Tao to me, right? Like it's it's so big and it's so, to me, that's what God is. Like, how could you describe God? Like, how did all of this stuff happen? It's just not really possible to fit that into a nice little box and say, well, if you do this, then this God will be happy. And if you don't do that, this God will be unhappy. But there's certain things that I know that when I'm feeling disconnected, uh, that I have responsibility and I can control what my relationship is with the world around me. Yeah, you know, Todd, also, if someone has a problem with the God word, what I use is love. Uh, yeah. So you could say, instead of let go and let God, you could say, let go and let love. Yeah. Am I going to choose to walk in love or fear? Yeah. Uh, I really look at it that way more than, uh, more than, uh, what the word God brings to the table, because sometimes that's a tough word for people because uh, they've, they've got, everyone's got these connotations around that word, the, but that box is very nasty for a lot of people. Nothing positive about that box yeah. at all. Yeah. Uh, so love really is where I resonate and that's where I've landed. And I don't think that will move uh, that, that I just look for the next loving action and yeah. the, everything else takes care of itself. Really. If I've got a situation that's not working, how can I get love into the situation? What can I do to be helpful? Yeah. You no. Know, and just like uh, breathing, you're loving your body's what you're doing. Exactly. So, yeah, that's great. That's great. Any, any comments? How about you've mentioned books, any podcasts that you like that, uh, that resonate with you spiritually. They don't necessarily have to be Tao, but if they're, you have any of those that you can. Um, do? I've uh, listened. I mean, one of the things I like to do is listen just to a lot of speakers just to get their stuff. So I listen to Sobercast. You know, I'll listen to a few of the others uh, that are more AA. But I think that's part of what makes you know the work that you've been doing, buddy, so unique. Is I don't really see a lot of people without this connection. Uh, of sort of the Tao to recovery. So one thing that I'm going to start um, very soon is I'm going to actually start teaching Qigong classes at our local AA center uh, and really start doing that. So I'm going to put them online. So eventually, so I have qigongforrecovery.com, uh, which is right now just a URL domain. It's nothing there. Uh, but, you know, same way that, you know, Shane sort of as his, one of his, ways of staying sober was to start a great podcast that I love to listen to, you know, the sober guy uh, and whether Qigong for recovery becomes a podcast or whatever, but I want to start doing weekly live Qigong classes for people in recovery. Uh, Cause there's so many ways to help detox the liver and, and, you know, just a lot of this stuff that we've been putting ourselves through, but if nothing else, really just a way to sort of calm that monkey mind that we all have. Yeah. You know, what this reminds me of is how, what recovery brought to me was open mindedness because I was not open minded before I came to recovery, raising some similar to, to what you were discussing about yourself and the open mindedness to just let everyone find their way yep. and not have to say this is right or this is wrong or that's bullshit. You know, even though I may think that at times, yep. I don't say that because everyone is using what their love language, their God language is at the moment. And who am I to say that language is wrong because it's not, it's what they need at this time. So I think the further up the mountain we get, the more similar the paths look, yeah. but we have to give people space to find those things. Absolutely. Just like you give the horse the reins, you know, we have to give people that space to, to find it for themselves and, and share our experience and leave it there. 
So Absolutely. good stuff. Thank you, Todd. Uh, think- any um, any closing comments or if you had one suggestion for a newcomer that was just coming in and was trying to, you know, get sober, what, what would you suggest to them? Just one thing. Uh, one thing. Uh, well, of course, don't drink, go to meetings, don't drink in between meetings. Um, but I would say just keep in mind that you can't do it by yourself. Yes. One of the best things that I ever heard on one of the fourth dimensions, uh, you know, somebody once said that I use all the time now, you know, the difference between wellness and illness is we, not I. Ah, that's great. Yes, I remember that. Uh, And I have a link in the podcast notes. It's the fourth dimensioners, 9 p.m. Eastern every night of the year. Uh, And it's great group, good AA group. Check it out if you're looking for some online meetings or want a little more information about AA. It's really good, solid AA as as far as we're concerned. So just celebrated its three year anniversary. Did exactly started right when COVID started. Uh, it's a good group. Check it out. Zoom AA meetings dot com will get you there, and I will have a link in the notes. Thank you, Todd, so much for making this time. You have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. Hello, this is Buddy C. I wanted to make you aware of several recovery-related resources that I've posted in the episode description. These resources include a list of recovery podcasts, a free sober meditation app, daily recovery email, shared Google recovery calendars. Hope you put some of these resources to use and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends in recovery.